Hello everyone. So this is the introductory lecture to your module for stress and dynamics, level one course. Ian Barton is doing the stress part and Gary Atkinson is doing the dynamics. And this is Ian Barton here. So I will be delivering the stress analysis. This is representing the fact that you're doing a UE um, faculty um, in engineering mechanics module. Uh, the specific module code for stress and dynamics is the FH3 bit. It's a 30 credit module, so it's an important module and that you're on level one. Stress and dynamics is split up into two halves, so they mirror one another. We've got 50% for stress analysis. Effectively, this is statics. And then you've got 50% for dynamics. Uh, so you study the, your statics up to Christmas over a 12-week period. After Christmas, you have an exam in January, and that's worth 40% of the total. During the first semester, there is two batches of online tests, which are worth 10% of the marks. For dynamics, provided things don't change, we will have a, um, that'll probably be May, I guess. You'll have an exam uh, in probably around May time, that, that's been that's to be decided and that'll be worth 40% of your marks and I think dynamics typically splits up the online tests in maybe about three batches and they all be worth 10 marks for both um, um, semesters there's a one-hour lecture and then there will be a two-hour tutorial Personally speaking, I think it's most important that you attend the, the tutorial. This is where you'll work on your problem sheets. So aim not to get ahead on problem sheets, really. Take them and work on them w at your lab tutorial. If you don't manage to finish them during that lab tutorial, then work on them as homework. And if there's issues with, uh, with completing them, then contact me and I'll try and resolve them. So bring your course notes with you to your lab tutorials and um, uh, if you've got questions on the course notes, questions about the exams, that's when you address them. They're called lab tutorials, so they're not only just uh, doing problem sheets and working on the course notes, but uh, <coughs> you'll also be doing some labs as well. These labs will be forming part of your e-testing so it's uh, good to attend for that reason as well. Really important you come to the labs and engage and work with others. You'll find that you'll be learning a lot from other students if you work in pairs and groups so um, I would strongly advise you to do that and it's an opportunity for you to do test yourself and push yourself and get yourself in the region of plus 90 for the schema work, make sure you go to Blackboard and the schema work and schedule is there. As the semester moves on, there might be some tweaking of the, the delivery and so that schema work will be updated accordingly. So um, so don't take it, it's going to be the schema work is an initial plan, so there might be some minor changes during, during the semester. So for the stress analysis, this is essentially speaking study in statics. Um, nice word statics kind of gives you a nice uh, equilibrium with the other word, um, dynamics. So what do I mean by equilibrium? Well, equilibrium is actually a word that we're going to be using in statics. And it's when we add up all our forces, and when we add up our forces, they all come to zero. But also, because we're dealing with bodies, so they're of 3D shape, when we add up the turning moments, so the turning forces, 
things that might cause me to ruin it, the rotate, they also add up to zero. So when we've got this condition, forces all adding up to zero, turning moments all adding up to zero, we've got a static body, and this is an important component that we're studying in this semester. Forces are quantities which uh, should be strictly described as a vector. A vector will have a magnitude and a direction. And in the statics and also the dynamics part of the course, we'll be dealing with more than just your gravitational force, but surface forces, concentrated, distributed load forces, body forces, forces that uh, respond by something being a hinge, maybe, or a supported reaction. So our forces can be going off in all sorts of directions, so it's important that we define um, them as a vector and give them a sense of direction. Moments, probably the majority of you would have come across a moment before or come across it in terms of the word talk. But technically speaking, there's a slight technical difference between what a moment is and what a talk is. Using the word moment is a bit more generic in meaning, so we'll use that word. A moment is found by the perpendicular distance times by the force being applied. And why we need to calculate it is because it will give us a sense of whether the body is rotating or how much um, twisting force there is, rotating force there is on a body. So our classic calculation would be that we want to find the, the distance, a perpendicular force being applied there. So this distance here is uh, 0.5 meters. It has a force of 100 newtons. So the moment is going to be force times distance here. So that's going to be 100 times 0.5, which gives us 50 newton meters. Don't make the mistake of writing joules, because that's wrong. Some a lot of people, well, not some a lot of people. Some people see newton meters and they think, well, that is the same as a joule. It's not. It has to be separated units because where a moment consists of a force, so newtons, and a distance. So it's not like work done or something like that. Now, if we had a uh, force, let's say, coming out here in a skewed direction. One approach would be to take what's called the line of action of the force and imagine that that force is going to move somewhere, even into the outer space, and look for a distance that's perpendicular and then imagine that we're going to apply this force down here. That's fine, you can, you can certainly do that, that's not uh, an incorrect approach. But normally, because of our bodies, they are normally horizontal and vertical, it's best to y keep uh, that horizontal force and the vertical force components and not trying to work out what the force is in some arbitrary point in space. So how we do that, we can do that by taking this force and split it in into two components. So I could split it into... I'm taking y to be in that direction, split it into a y component and split it into a x component. So I've split it up this force here. And when you've split it up the force there, this force here we can now treat as two separate forces. It's acting through the pivot, so it doesn't create any turning moment. It pushes on my pivot, but it's not actually making the the bar want to turn round. This force, however, is making the bar want to turn round. Let's say it's a distance of one meter away. And let's say this force here is, oh, it's a little bit less than this force. So let's say it's uh, 50 newtons. So we can see applying this skewed force at this distance is now going to give me a turning moment of 50 times a distance of 1. So we're going to get 50 newton meters. So we can see here we've applied a smaller force 
further away and we've ended up with the same turning moment so we, you'll notice that with jars or whatever so um, trying to turn a, a, a jar with a small cap can be difficult and you get these devices can't you that clamp onto the jars and gives you greater you know, the force that you can apply is usually about the same but you've got now a greater distance so you've got a greater turning moment for as a as a turning moment is going to effectively be a vector just like a force so we need to define what we're going to classify as positive and negative and we'll take a clockwise motion that we can see looking down on a page as positive and an anti-clockwise motion as negative okay so here's an example of what is the moment so this was a, uh, a turning point question in the lecture what is the moment produced by a 10 newton force being applied at the end of two meters here so the, uh, the trick in this is testing the your understanding of the sign convention so you can straight you see straightforward that it, we've got a 10 newton force it's two meters away so we've got 20 Newton meters. However, it's creating a negative um, <coughs> turning moment, so therefore the correct answer is minus 20 Newton meters. If this um, setup, we've got a pivot here in the middle, so if this setup is uh, to be a part of the static schools so it's not rotating, we're going to have to sum up our forces in this problem and they're going to have to sum up to zero. If the if the if we've got a overall sum up our moments and they don't come to zero, then that means that that body must be experiencing some rotation. So in this particular case, what I could do is I've got one meter away there and I'm applying a a twenty newton case there and here I've got um, two meters away and I'm applying 20 newtons there so you can see this is a, an example where our summing of the moments is not going to give us a zero, a zero answer so what would that be so the first force that we can see we're going to say is going to be minus 10 times by a distance of 1 and the second one, so that's a, that's because it's going anti-clockwise. What's a good thing to do is to draw a little clock face around your pivot so you can see does this arrow agree with this arrow? And if it if the arrows don't agree, then it's going to be a minus. So it's a minus 10 times 1. This arrow is going downwards. So this arrow does agree with this arrow, so it's a positive. So it's going to be a plus 20 times 2 equals a total of 30 newton meters so we would need to apply another force let's say we we could apply a force here one meter so that this force is going to be going anti-clockwise create a negative moment and so i could apply a 30 Newton force here, one meter away, and then that would then make my my bar to be a rigid, rigid problem with no rotation. Okay, so there we um, are going for derivations. So I'm summing up the forces, and I can see that I overall I'm going to get a 30 newton meter result. So one of the things uh, we want to be able to do is uh, we've seen that already that we want to be able to split up forces into x and y components it's going to make it easier to work out our moments 
So you, we need to have some basic trig. We need to know in particular how to use the sine function and the cos function and how they relate to a basic triangle. So a sine function is going to be based upon the opposite divided by the hypotenuse and a cos function is going to be based upon the adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Tend not to use the tan function so much in statics analysis, but uh, it's uh, sometimes useful to know as well. Where well, tan will be opposite divided by adjacent. So all that sort of stuff you should be able to do and uh, know about. So if you imagined you have a force component here, we can in effect break this up into uh, going in an arbitrary direction, theta. Uh, resolved from the horizontal, we can break it up into a, a horizontal component and a y component. The other one that we should know about is Pythagoras, and in this particular case, the total force F squared is going to equal the x component for squared plus the y component for squared. So that's the Pythagoras rule. And then hopefully the, you should be able to know that the total force here can be, uh, we can find the horizontal component using the total force times by cos theta in the x direction and therefore in the y direction we can use the total force times sine theta. One of the things I like to do is I, I like to tend to work with just cos theta and that becomes a bit more obvious uh, why you would want to do so, in particular when you're working on frameworks. So um, working out what this angle is if we were doing this problem. So an alternative would be to find that uh, we have total force cos gamma. So with a cos we always swing through the angle um, so here you can see that you're swinging through theta so you're using cos theta and here we're, we're swinging through to find the y component so we're f swinging through cos gamma so that's an alternative approach to using sine sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's easier to use the sines but sometimes it's easier to work out what's that other angle and then to use a cos And then finally, the tan is something you might want to use, and that's uh, the going to be the opposite value divided by the adjacent value. So this is an example that the we get certain types of triangles that we use quite a lot in this module because we're just using them as examples. So example one is a 30 degrees right angle triangle, 45 degrees, and then what's called a 3-4-5 triangle, used by the Greeks a lot, I think. 3-4-5 triangle is nice because uh, one side is free, a length of free, or ratio of free. Another one is four, and then the hypotenuse te works out to be five. doesn't give us a particularly nice theta value but the uh, uh, in the sense of uh, it's not uh, an integer or anything but the hypotenuse is has a resultant of 5 so it, um, so it's quite a nice one to do calculations and stuff without getting horrible um, numbers and so on So this angle here is 39.9 .9 degrees, that's to four sig figure, I think. So remember the UE, don't you love it, the UE convention is we're going to be taking uh, forces in the global sense uh, uh, to be positive upwards and forces in the global sense, positive left to right. 
and clockwise positive. When I say in the global sense, we might locally want to define a force um, in a particular direction, so we might want to define that to be a force uh, if we're doing a slope problem, or if, <coughs> or if we're doing a framework problem where a lot of frameworks are coming down. Again, we might want to define that that to be locally as a uh, downward force. <coughs> but otherwise, our convention will be that we've got a coordinate system such that we've got x, y, and we've got positive rotation. Why is stress important? Basic definition of stress is it some force divided by an area <coughs> and the stress experienced in a material usually is the thing that's going to define on how much that material is going to elongate and when it's going to fracture not necessarily the force because we can make a, a an object thicker so it can take more force for example whereas um, the material that the stress has usually in essentially speaking we can't change it's kind of fixed to that materials properties so that um, that's why stress and working out the stress inside a member and relating it back to the material is uh, so important the kind of force and the kind of area we're going to deal with varies from problem to problem it's, it's there's different types of stress and we'll be talking about that later in lecture four the units of stress since it, we're dealing with force divided by area well we know that uh, force can be measured in newtons and area can be measured in meters squared so we could do newtons per meter squared one that's one option um, another option is that, um, and this was introduced actually before um, um, before Pascal's was standardised for pressure vessels. So you do get Pascal's being used. So Pascal's, um, strictly speaking, is for pressure vessels, but uh, it is often used in stress analysis. Because a pa one Pascal or one Newton per meter squared is not much in terms of a stress value. Normally, stress values are millions uh, in size. Um, we often use mega Newton meter squared or mega Pascals. Some engineers don't like using mega. So uh, you'll find that that's the equivalent of using a Newton millimeter squared. So a tiny little millimeter um, will um, and how much st uh, force is being applied there. So that, that ends up uh, giving me a value the same as that. Okay. On the whole, I'll be using megapascals to talk about numbers. So just point out that a mega is 1 times 10 to the 6. There's different types of stress. And the stress that I'm going to mainly be interested in and talk about up to lecture 6 or 7 is um, direct or normal stress. Direct or normal stress will have the sig symbol sigma and it refers to the fact that we've got maybe a beam here with cross-sectional area and let's say we're pulling it apart with a force. So um, that's the kind of stress I'm going to be looking at for at least for the first um, dozen or so lectures. Then there's shear stress, 
be looking at that more towards the end. Bending moment stress, which we'll be looking at in lectures something like eight to ten. Um, so they are the three types of stress, and I won't be mentioning them anymore at this induction introduction point. Of course, there is good stress and bad stress. So it's nice to be under a little bit of stress, but not too much. But this course will mainly deal with good stress. You'll experience a lot of good stress in this course. If you get your stress calculations wrong, then uh, BTCH can happen. So this is a acronym attributed to Arnold, Dr. Arnold Marie. And that stands for bad things can happen. Okay. So this is an example of bad things can happen. You can see the references at the bottom of the screen there if you want to read more. They can snap, things can collapse, fracture, rupture, we're really looking at that. Things get crushed. How about this one? And they can pancake. Structures falling apart like a pancake. And then things get ripped off. But we'll be looking at bridges mainly. So this is the Clifton Suspension Bridge, reference from the BBC website, being constructed. And uh, uh, soldiers marching off to Avonmouth, I guess. There. And the uh, um, celebrations of, uh, of January the 1st, all the pretty fireworks going off on the bridge there. Because you Bristol Post newspaper. We're going to be analysing beam bridges. So a straight beam going across. And also framework bridges, so truss bridges. So this is an example of a Pratt bridge. So that tells you a little bit uh, about the stress course and a little bit about me. So a breakdown uh, in terms of uh, chronological history. Um, I was a lecturer at City of Bristol College for five years. Prior to that, a scientist at BA Systems. Four years at Brunel. And uh, two years at Surfax a, uh, as a research engineer. And two years at Cambridge as a research fellow. So that's my, my background. Let's talk about the delivery. So, previously mentioned how the module is broken down, pretty much mirror image of stress analysis and dynamics. You've got your 12 weeks. Um, the exams for both components are worth 40%. Online testing is for both components is worth 10%. So hopefully all of that is uh, clear. In terms of passing, because it's a combined module, the rules of um, of you getting above a certain threshold, um, it's a combined exam threshold that you were looking at um, getting above. Things that you should be able to do to some degree is be able to form a free body diagram before you be able to do the course. Have an appreciation of of how supports become reactions and um, the reactions are external forces that need to be calculated. So drawing up a free body diagram, that's one of the kind of prerequisites for the course. Appreciating that the course uses this sign convention for our moments and for our global force directions. So finally, this, the essential trick that you're going to need for the course is uh, understanding about radians, so one radian 
what that equals. So a radian is, uh, if you take uh, this, whatever the radius is, oops, so we've got this radius here. So that distance, and I, then I take that distance and I take it on my circumference, move that distance apart. That angle that I create is defined as one radian. So it pans out that, uh, in effect, that means that you've got uh, two pi radians is uh, 360 degrees. So you can sort of do the derivation yourself. So it's based upon the circumference being two pi r. So being able to convert from degrees to radians, all we need to do is use the 360 degrees equals 2 pi radians. So if you've got an angle in radians, then uh, and you want to convert that into, um, uh, or rather, is it other way around, sorry. If uh, if we've got a uh, angle in degrees, and we want to convert that into radians, we take divide it by 180 and then times it by pi and then that will give us a result in radians. If we've got an angle in radians then we divide it by pi multiply it by 180 and then we'll get the answer in terms of degrees. Okay, So just think, am I in radians? Yes, then divide by pi times by 180. Am I in degrees? Then divide by 180 times by pi. Your basic trig we need to know, so I've already previously mentioned that, so you, you as a prerequisite, we expect you to know the sine theta, cos theta, tan theta, I don't know what you use for numerics to remember your sines, your coses and your tans. I use silly old Harry, catch a hair, two noughts are. Not very good ones are they? We use irrational numbers and special case angles, so these are good to know in terms of, so we get our special angles are going to be related to 0 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees and 90 degrees, and in particular the cos column is useful. So at 0 degrees you've got a value of 1, root 3 divided by 2, you could say that also as root 2 divided by 2, or 1 over root 2. Then you've got half, and then 0. The How the degrees relate to the radians, so we've got uh, 0 there, 0 and 0. Uh, 30, I need to divide that by 180, it leaves me with a 6. 45 divided by 180 leaves me with a quarter. And 60 divided by 180 leaves me with a third. 90 divided by 180 leaves me with a half. Okay, And then I need to put times and by pi to make them into a radian. How I remember this column myself is I start off by going uh, root 4 divided by 2. Root 3 divided by 2. Root 2 divided by 2 root 1 divided by 2, root 0 divided by 2. So you can see the first special angle is root 4 divided by 2, so that's 2 divided by 2 equals 1. The second one, root 3 divided by 2, doesn't simplify any further. Next one, root 2 divided by 2, well you can then simplify that if you want to to 1 over root 2. And, the f and this one here, a root 1, what's root 1? Well it's 1. So divided by 2 gives me the half. And then root 0, what is the root 0? Well that's 0, so that gives me 0. So that's my little, my little method of uh, uh, memorizing those special angles there. Values. Having a basic appreciation of what the cos function looks like going to be typically just going 90 degrees worth on it so it drops off like that and the basic appreciation of your sign 
again typically up to 90 degrees is the essential trig that we need to uh, need to know and that um, as you go up to 90 degrees this tan is going to go off to infinity so it's pretty much going to be uh, this region in for each trig function that we're going to be using it might be going up to 180 but in statics we're usually looking at acute angles of the framework little factoid for you that um, trigonometry in Greek means the measure of triangles tell your friends Pythagoras essential that you know that so if I've got uh, two angles uh, a right angle uh, and then the vertical uh, the vertical and the horizontal lines let's assume that we've arranged them like this or rather the two shorter lines I should say so I'm going to call that A and B uh, if I square them and add them up that will equal the square of the longer lines so that's the Pythagoras' theorem so if we have any right angle triangle the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides that's Pythagoras' theorem so that big length there the area of that will equal the sum of the area of the a squared and plus the b squared so that's Pythagoras remember Pythagoras a lot of people don't appreciate this is really in disguise form um, so I'm thinking sine squared theta plus cos squared theta or cos squared theta plus sine squared theta depends how I'm going to find uh, theta in this case um, right okay I've done that wrong let's do the other way around so let's have theta here so that would be then cos squared theta plus sine squared theta that's better okay so um, uh, you can see that if we've got this relationship I could divide through by c squared so that gives me a over c <coughs> so square it and then we've got b over c square it and a over c if I'd put my feeder here I mean I could have put my feeder there and if I put my feeder in this little acute angle here that's going to give me the cos squared so cos theta is going to be a over c and here we then define sine theta as b over c okay nice way to do Pythagoras theorem you can leave this as homework and try it yourself is uh, define a slightly skewed square within a square so that's going to be your length c this is going to be my length A and this is going to be my length B and then off you go so we've got a length A here and a length B um, so you can see that the overall length is going to be A plus B squared and uh, then you can uh, compare that with the area of the square plus the triangles and then you can derive Pythagoras' uh, equation that's the way I derive it there's lots of proofs for Pythagoras' theorem and I think one of them includes a proof from an American president could be Donald Trump final checklist here for my UE students is that uh, Make sure that you get my emails and the emails get sent out via Blackboard so they go through the Blackboard system. So you need to make sure that you go onto your UE account and if you're using some local messaging service forward your UE email onto that. You can set that up. Um, go to the tutorials, pick up the course notes 
and watch the videos that are being produced for you on a week by week basis on Blackboard. Thank you very much.